let's get started. Um, and um, so, so this is a presentation that'll be um, uh, jointly presented by myself and uh, Nick and Hidia. And it is um, the first of a two-parter about um, NextFlow and um, how to get started with um, using NextFlow workflows and how it might be um, useful for your next data analysis. And um, so we'll provide some motivation and background about workflow software, um, when and why to use workflow software. And in this session, we'll cover key uh, terms and concepts for NextFlow functionality. And um, so to get us started off, uh, what is a workflow? Um, in data analytics, computer science, research, um, a workflow is um, basically a software that uh, is a recipe for uh, multi-step processes. And uh, in uh, using it for this, it's actually very powerful, workflow software is. And um, what I mean is that uh, processes are usually conditional and reactive in workflow syntax. And um, the workflow software typically supports um, processes in several ways. So it takes care of file management and memory management, among other things. Um, and there are several different um, workflow languages out there, um, or, or syntaxes, I should say. Uh, and fortunately, many of these are based around languages that are generally used in programming and, um, and scripting. So Nextflow, which we'll talk about here, is based around the Groovy syntax. Uh, but there's also Snake SnakeMake, uh, which is based on Python and, and uh, more closely re resembles Python. And then Common Workflow Language, which is similar to um, YAML syntax. So then um, speaking to NextFlow in particular, so um, we've defined what a workflow is and that there's several varieties, but uh, NextFlow has um, a few uh, particular concepts and terminology if you wanna get familiarized with um, before you begin. So within NextFlow, um, the workflow and uh, also the kind of tasks or processes within the workflow uh, come in the form of these .nf extension file. And um, the uh, NextFlow workflow file um, defines, um, or, or it either loads or defines a task, or in other words, a process. And then the workflow itself comprises of processes, uh, one or more processes. And then um, connecting these different processes are um, what are called channels. And so an individual process has uh, both an input and output channel implied. And then it also has a task that's performed. And uh, what do I mean by channel? A channel is basically a variable stream, but it connects uh, variables in different environments. And so it may connect uh, that stream of um, information from your local environment or your uh, remote environment to the kind of workflow environment or the digital environment created by the workflow. Uh, but it also um, serves as a way of kind of handling information. So um, getting familiar with handling channels and also um, a concept uh, called channel consumption is important for um, becoming comfortable with using workflows and being able to kind of understand how a workflow um, uh, processes information and gets tasks done efficiently. And also if you would need to change different parameters in a workflow. So another um, benefit of this is um, the defaults work great, but workflow um, software is typically very um, fine tunable. And, um, but for general utilization, we don't need to get into that. Um, and then the other thing that um, is important to note is that there's other um, concepts to become familiar with if you wish to be a developer or to uh, obtain kind of mastery of workflow syntax. And so some of those concepts would be the directed acyclic graph for patterns of operations that um, dictate the flow of information in a workflow. And then first in, first out is um, a pattern by which uh, these kind of variable streams uh, or channels um, are utilized by the processes. And this can change um, the sequence of uh, data processing and when certain tasks complete versus um, uh, when certain tasks don't complete. So um, yeah, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Let's get into uh, NextFlow setup and workflow setup. So you can find abundant documentation and actually throughout this presentation, we uh, link to the excellent documentation for NextFlow. And um, in there, you'll note that um, you'll wanna take into consideration the version of your bash environment and that uh, 
Nextflow works um, best with POSIX systems. So that um, traditionally excludes uh, Windows. And um, from that documentation, you'll find that um, you can use curl and you can install it in a, in a fairly uh, standard way, uh, as with other software that works well in POSIX systems. However, also be uh, cognizant of the fact that in a remote environment or a high performance computing environment, such as JHPCE, um, they may support um, this module load operation. And um, so it may be as simple as loading the software that is already supported in that environment too. And then the next part of this presentation, we'll go through several example uh, scripts so that you become more familiar with Nextflow syntax and kind of um, what, what to look out for. And if uh, you don't have background working in workflow syntax, you know, what may look familiar, what may look a little bit less familiar. So first we'll walk through just um, each component of um, an example process.nf file. Um, and here, this is stored in a subdirectory in our project folder uh, modules and then um, process one to end up as the file name. And uh, for this example file, we have first, in the first line, we declare that uh, we wanna define a new process and then we'll call it um, FOO. So um, process called foo. And then in the curly braces, we have the process definition itself. And uh, here we start with the input channel, uh, which comprises of uh, the value of some variable X or some variable stream X and then the output, which is also some uh, variable stream X. And then, um, as I mentioned, uh, the, the um, Nextflow workflow comprises of uh, processes, but these processes are performing a task. And so the um, script chunk, where it says script colon, and then you have the quotes, this is defining what that task actually is. Um, so everything up to this point is kind of process, metadata, process, um, definition, but then here is the actual task definition. What, what are we actually doing with the variable stream? And then um, what, what is the actual output going to look like in some cases? So here um, we're echoing the value of um, the uh, variable stream to some uh, file. And um, the other thing to note here is that, you know, the, the script call and the task call um, as here, it, it kind of, it, it looks like a command line call to, um, the uh, Linux shell. And um, so it can look like this, but it can also look uh, like sourcing a script. And one can think of this in a similar way to kind of interacting with a command line environment, um, either remote or um, locally. Um, and then I um, included this from um, some uh, a previous presentation because um, for our users, I find it's helpful to remind that you know there's several ways to um, call R and interact with um, R scripts. And um, but but if you're more comfortable with using Python, um, there's there's also you know several different ways to call Python as well. Um, so this slide is just showing three different examples of process tasks uh, that would source uh, our code or um, perform a task involving our script. In the first example, we um, uh, echo some text. Uh, first, we will note that we use shell instead of script, um, but, but you can use either or. And um, echoing from command line the text two plus two and piping it into an R session with the dash dash uh, slave tag and then saving that to new output.txt is the task that would be performed here. And then in the second example, um, it's actually defining a full script. So you can see the shebang line calls the R script software, similar to example one, but then the contents of that would be um, uh, the contents of the script. So it would be um, several lines uh, parsed in the, um, the environment that R script is utilizing. And so here that's just storing some text to an object or a variable called OBJ and then saving OBJ to uh, new file.rmd. And then finally, um, we uh, uh, just use script and then um, call the R script software. And here we actually have um, three dollar sign variables. So these correspond to um, environment variables used by Nextflow. And here um, is a uh, dollar sign params that R script path would be <clears throat> an R script uh, path variable that is uh, called from the workflow environment. And then dollar sign, uh, or dash F would be like an argument in the R script itself, uh, followed by uh, dollar sign file path. 
So some variable file path from a channel and then uh, the dash V uh, flag followed by dollar sign value for um, uh, another channel <laughs> passing a dollar sign value uh, variable to the dash V flag in our script. And um, so uh, next we'll just go through like an example workflow script and um, and, and I'll just mention you know a, a few things uh, that might be helpful here for um, if, if you're looking at a .nf workflow script, um, what are some features that you might find? So in the front matter of the workflow.nf script, you'll find um, here the uh, shebang and then nextflow.enable.dsl equals two. And so that's just being explicit that um, the script is parse, parsing a nextflow script that one should um, run the script with the nextflow command from command line or that the, um, the uh, program should recognize this. And then um, nextflow enable DSL2. DSL2 is actually the current and latest um, version of the nextflow syntax that's most widely used. Um, and then um, that, that's followed by a comment. So um, just defining what, what is the uh, workflow doing. And you'll notice that the comment has like a slash and star syntax. And then here is um, a process index, the def or a definition of a process called index in all caps. Um, sometimes instead you'll see that uh, the process is loaded from an external file. So you might see something that is sourcing um, a file called um, index.nf, for instance, at some folder called modules. And um, so that can be a more compact way of defining the process that's actually used by the workflow. But here, um, the index process has some input channel transcriptome, some output um, um, path salmon index, and then the actual task itself is calling the salmon software. Um, it's performing an index command with threads as specified in the, um, or the number of threads specified as task.cpus, um, and then dollar sign transcriptome corresponding to the input channel variable and then the um, salmon index uh, corresponding to the index file where we, we save the output. And then um, the workflow definition itself is just workflow and then curly braces. And you'll see that the um, index process is stored to the variable index underscore channel. And the thing to note about this is that here um, we're actually using params that transcript on file. And so um, what I want to mention about params is it's a scope variable. It allows uh, multiple variable values to be stored and overrides values in an a.nf uh, workflow script. And then um, it's used for convenience. So um, it's uh, four command line flags and it can be thought of similar to um, the arg parse package to uh, make scripts command line callable. And um, so here that uh, params variable is being read and then passed to the input channel of the defined process. And then finally, that's called in the task definition for the script chunk. And um, you can find at the links more details about params and about um, the um, .nf workflow syntax. Um, and then um, calling this would be uh, a matter of just saying next flow run and then main.nf with this script uh, as main.nf in the current working directory. Um, so next, I think uh, Nick will have a code demonstration for us. Yep. Um, thanks for the intro. I will um, get the stuff ready and then share my screen. Okay. Um, so we've shown some examples of processes, and um, we've been sort of following along a lot of the next few tutorials on um, like our NAC pipeline that they provide. Um, so what I was going to do is I was going to show how to actually run it on JHPC. Um, so here at right now I have open um, the repository for um, that you can find on. Yes. Okay, <laughs> anyway, um, so right here I have opened the repository that you can find linked in the uh, our sites above uh, Google Doc. So this includes actually some of the, the process segments that Sean showed, um, as well as the demo that I'm going to be doing right now. Um, 
So I'm going to open up a terminal with uh, JHDC. Um, and so to run Nextflow, uh, as normal, you would open up a compute, an interactive session on a compute node. So I'm going to, we don't need too much memory with this. Um, just maybe I should make this a little bit uh, So yeah, I'm just requesting 10 gigs here. And um, in terms of the software, Nextflow is available as a module. Um, so you can just use module load Nextflow, and this is the specific version we'll be using today. Um, next, I'll be loading Singularity, and that just happens to be because this pipeline that we're going to be using um, manages supports managing software with Singularity. We'll talk more about that in the next session, but for now, just know that they have a configuration that allows you to use Singularity to manage software dependencies. Like, um, there's going to be several ones, like FastQC, for example, um, Salmon, and MultiQC are some of the software tools. Um, so we do have a Singularity module as well. Um, okay, and next, we're just going to be directly running the, the pipeline. So next flow, this next flow run command, you can provide it a GitHub repository. So like the, the username and then the name of the repository, and it will pull it and then run it. Um, so that's what we're doing here. And as far as these two options, um, the profile says that, like what configuration profile you want to use. That's something we'll cover in more detail next session as well. Um, and normally, in theory, that should be documented. It wasn't well documented for their pipeline, but um, essentially, this this Slurm profile uses Slurm to submit individual processes as um, Slurm jobs, and it also manages software with Singularity. So that's why we loaded Singularity process, or module. Um, so yeah, we can just actually just execute this here. Oh, I didn't, I didn't talk about the work directory. So some, a useful tip on JHPCE is that we have this high um, a disk that's like higher input and output, like it's higher, it's faster basically. Um, and you can access it with this MyScratch uh, environment variable. So this is where Nextflow will write temporary files. So this is just like um, a, it's a good use of the temporary file system that we have at JHPC. Um, and this dash w argument, by the way, is supported by any next level pipeline. So it's not specific to like this RNC. So I'm just going to run this interactively um, and show you what it looks like. Pulling it from the state repository. And it takes a while because it has to actually start up Java and then pull the repository. So in the profile, you define the, the name of the uh, the operat operative system that you want to create these environment variables? Yeah, um, yeah. so Nextflow supports like a bunch of different, um, like, so Slurm, SGE, uh, yeah. all sorts of, uh, yeah. yeah, also. And make your know, different profiles. So you need to build a profile? Yeah, so the person yeah, who. Before to declare it in that yeah. variable, oh, okay. Yeah, so the person, not, not the question. Yeah. yeah, the person designing the workflow has to say like, this is, what the Slurm configuration profile entails. Like, um, but Nextflow does support it, so you don't have to like write too much code to do it. Okay. That's something we'll cover in more detail. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, here we can see the processes are, um, it's reporting what's going on for each process. So each of these is a individual job that gets submitted with S batch, basically. Mm -hmm. It's a Slurm job. Um, and here you can see like how many, uh, in this case, we only have like one sample essentially. So if you had like three samples, you might run, it might say like one of three, zero of three um, for a sort of particular process. Um, Sorry, now where did you define this, where the samples are? Um, so that's in the, um, that was, this is using their default. So by default, they configured it so that it used, they have some test samples that get run if you don't specify. Um, Oh, so yeah. those are test I samples have, just came yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Order with uh, test data sets. Yeah. 
So they have small, large data sets. So by default, it will take the small data set you know, to run the Python. OK. Yeah, so I didn't, I didn't like hide anything. So everything I've done is actually like what will happen if you run it as well. So it's not like um, it actually pulled those test files and it's running on that. This is how you run the Speakeasy too, right? Uh, yes, yeah, Speakeasy is similar. I mean, normally I would recommend Speakeasy is a big pipeline, so I would recommend running that um, in a job itself rather than an interactive session. Uh, but essentially, it's the same type of thing. Yeah. Um, so this should be done maybe uh, very So if I have to write, run this interactively, let's say I have ten samples, I would have like my samples, like. Um, files, FASTQ files, and what, my scratch work, that directory? Um, so uh, yeah, depending on what pipeline you're running. So this one doesn't use, um, actually, yeah, it does. Um, yeah, you might have your own FASTQ files. And I would, if it's a small, like, I guess I would, one caveat is like, for speakeasy, sometimes we have like hundreds of samples mm -hmm. and it's actually too much to fit on this one. the one single okay. <laughs> that's, that's the one thing. Um, so if it's a smaller one, you can, my scratch is good, but yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you have to define that somewhere. You are hmm. okay, I sign it. Yeah, so okay, so did tell us, yeah. tell them where, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and you see, yeah, every pipeline will be different in terms of how you specify the inputs. Um, so we'll get into um, I'll show the actual code for this pipeline in a second where we would say like where our samples are. Yeah, so yeah, there's something to do with the, uh, like the configuration file. Mm -hmm. So where you specify like the sample the classic and the reference to not have And okay. do, do they have pipelines for everything or are they sick? I can see there is a pipeline. Yeah, I will talk about this yeah. and where you will have a, uh, you can go to check, you know, if you are interested like in yeah, one pipeline. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a huge community yeah. of like resources with a lot of public things, yeah. It's very good to know. Yeah. Yeah. That's your section. Yeah. yeah, that's my section. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> but yeah, it's amazing actually. I, I I would also mention that I, I think a lot of the um documentation shows like um the the way to call multiple samples or to specify like a file name pattern and um so that like re reading through that and then trying out um, a small batch of like a few samples with, with those kinds of instructions, like it could help you to decide if like the workflow is um, meant to be run on a small number or a large number. There's actually taking a moment to figure out what the pipeline is. Um, I will... Um... You can move it. Yeah, we can talk about um we'll open up another app here. Another thing I was gonna talk about is like this next little info command. So for a given pipeline, uh, oh I need to actually load the um module. Um that'll report things like um the GitHub URL, um where the files live locally, that's a big thing. Um, and some other details, but for now we'll use this to figure out where it actually downloaded the files. Um, I think it's still because you have to More. It was running quickly last. I feel like it's one of those things where when you actually present, it goes slower than yeah. when you test it. Um, That's sweet. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, here's the local path. Um, so, I'm going to check back on. That's where it's hanging. But anyways, um, I actually, for speed, I have this path already opened. So if, but if you were to try to figure out where it was, that would be how you do it. Um, so here, it, here their pipeline is installed locally. Something I was going to show how to do is just like, let's say we're interested in modifying a process slightly. Um, in this case, they have processes in what are called modules, which are sort of like units of the workflow. Well, sorry, this is just where you installed Nextflow. This is where it pulled it automatically. Um, pulled okay. this RNC pipeline. Um, okay. So, yeah. um, 
Oh, so this is the RNC pipeline. Yeah, that got pulled when I ran the next load run. Yeah, so we have, yeah, for each, like, for example, fast QC, it's a module. Mm -hmm. From the process, yeah, you have the module. And from the modules, you make a sub workflow or a workflow. So yeah, that's that'll be so you go from yeah to big, you know. Yeah, there's a concept we'll, we'll cover next time. Yeah, in more detail. Um, for now, we'll, we'll let's just say that we know that the processes in this file, or um, let's say we want to modify multi QC. So one thing, um, I would have shown it before if the thing ran quicker, but I was going to show that um, it doesn't actually output a log for multi QC. So let's say we we're interested in adding that. So we have this. Um, the actual process definition here. Um, so I haven't found a better way to do this, but Nexel has this internal file called uh, .command.log in each process that gets run. Um, and so we're just gonna write that, and basically that log, all of the outputs for a process get typed into that log. So we're just gonna rename it essentially to something more informative. Um, it's like you see log. Um, so that's going to be a file we create as part of a process. And then the other thing is we want to output it. So we're going to include this in the output declaration. And it is a path. So we just specify it like this. Um, something we didn't mention is like this, this publish dirt thing says like where the output files get published. So that's just, so in this case, we are actually publishing this as an output file. So. Um, I'm just gonna kill this. Um, and I'll save this. Um, the next thing I was gonna show is like if you want to resume the pipeline, we're just gonna run the exact same command but add this dash resume. So that what that does um, is all of the processes that already finished won't have to rerun. Um, they get cached. I'll show you what that looks like when you. And it's output the next load. So it only runs like we we changed one process and it will, will run from well it didn't finish the one process last time, so it's gonna rerun that. But yeah, here you'll say you'll show that it cached it, cached the output so it doesn't have to rerun. Um and let's see how much time we have. Maybe for the sake of time. I was going to show that what, like where the output log goes, but I feel like this is hanging right now. Yeah. So um, by default, they go into this results folder that gets um, that is what it's going. So here's the results folder. Oh, it's working. Oh, it's working. Okay. So I'm yeah. going to So in a second, based on what we specified, we should get that out that output log in this results folder. Um, the last time I ran it, it was pretty quick. So we'll yeah. look at that. I mean, multi QC is nice because it gives you like an HTML report. So maybe the log might not be that important in this case, but I think in general it's good to like have logs for your processes. So it should finish up, and then it, there's a message that shows that it completed, and here's the main report you see for the multi QC. Um, but we also, uh, yeah. So here's this multi QC log that we just created. Um, and here to show you the log. So, um, yeah, that was all I had for the demo. I guess the next session, next section will be Hedia talking about the community resources for. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I will talk about uh, NFCore. So, uh, NFCore is a community effort to collect curated uh, set of analysis pipeline built using uh, Nextflow. So why uh, NF Core is so interesting? Because instead of duplicating pipeline, is making people collaborate together to have you know a set of pipeline that are available to the community. Let's say I want uh, the RNA-seq pipeline to use. Uh, I have this, you know. Uh, I will show where you have to look for the pipeline, and I can run that pipeline. And that pipeline is is tested, well documented. It's a very stable pipeline. So 
and uh, it has all the uh, like um, it's an updated pipeline. So that's why, uh, yeah, uh, NF Core is uh, really interesting for people uh, such as users, but also like platforms and developers. Uh, so as I said, uh, for facilities, yeah, it's really interesting because they have these highly optimized pipelines for user because it's very well documented and you can go and to see, to understand those pipelines and also to improve your skills, you know, in Nextflow and for developers because they um, develop together and collaborate to develop uh, new pipelines that are uh, yeah available to the community. And they uh, organize many times hackathons, so people work together to create modules, you know, that available are available to the community, and people can use these modules to make like sub workflows and workflows. So you don't have, you know, to start from scratch. Uh, here, getting started with uh, NF Core. Uh, if let's say you want like to develop a new pipeline, uh, you have to start from a template. They have like a, a template where they explain the steps on how adding a, a new pipeline. And they have also like guidelines. You, you can't, yeah, it's like a start like uh, coding your uh, pipeline like that. You have yeah, to follow like uh, rules for that. And then now I will start uh, like with uh, getting started with NF Core. Can you see my here my slide? So I took this presentation. It's available on the website of NF Core. And here, so you also can go to this link uh, to have a look at uh, the installation listing, how to run in those pipeline and troubleshooting. So first, okay, now you know how to install uh, Nextflow, but how about like NF Core? To install NF Core, it's uh, NF Core, it's a, a Python package. So you use a pip install NF Core, you need to have already installed, of course, like uh, Nextflow and containers such as Docker, depending, you know, on like the pipeline, what uh, kind of like conten containers uh, we will use. And uh, the Bioconda, you can also install uh, NF Core uh, via Bioconda. Now, if you want to have like a look at uh, what kind of uh, help you can get and what kind of options you know you can get with uh, NF Core. You type NF Core help, and here you know you can have a look at, for example, to see the version. If you want uh, to create a new pipeline, you put NF Core create. So it will show you how to create a new pipeline using the NF Core template. You can you know have uh, an idea about all these parameters. And then now uh, listing the pipeline. Let's say I want to have a look at all the pipelines that are uh, available in uh, NF Core. So you type NF Core list, you get the pipeline name, the stars, the latest release when it was released, the last pulled, and then if you have the latest release, you know, when you pull like the uh, pipeline from the GitHub. And then here they have a website, very interesting website with uh, NF Core pipelines. And here you have all the available pipelines. And uh, it's very interesting because you have, it's all the documentation, all the help you can have, you know, it's like with these pipelines. I don't, um, yeah. And to run uh, those pipelines, so as I said, you're you need to have Nextflow, install Docker or Singularity or Conda. If you work on JHPC, uh, you can't use Docker, so that's why uh, Nick used Singularity. And then, so to run the uh, NF Core, let's say, RNA-seq pipeline, you type 
Nexfloran, uh, Nex uh, Nex NFCore, RNA-seq, and here to get the latest release, dash R dev. And from, if you want to get, you know, the pipeline from the Git repository, you type uh, Nexflow pool NFCore RNA-seq, okay? Then if you want to have an idea about the documentation of this pipeline, you go to NFCore RNA-seq, you will get, you know, like the parameter documentation, the output docs, the user docs, the release, the uh, AWS results, so all the information, and you can go to this github.com nfcorrnc to have a look at the main, you know, it's like a, um, next flow, like script, the configuration, and there you can change something. If let's say you want to change the configuration file, so you go there and uh, you change, well, you don't go there, actually, you pull the pipeline and then you change the configuration file. So here, yeah, uh, in this link, you have the NF Corp and the pipeline. And as I said, you can also have uh, an idea about all the documentation concerning one pipeline. So you have NF Corp run, you put NF Corp RNA seq, but here, so you specify the name of the pipeline and you type help and you'll get all the information. It's like the input, output, you know, how to use uh, that pipeline. First of all, when you pull like a pipeline, you need to test it with a test data set. Why? Because sometimes uh, your next flow is not well installed. You have like uh, problems of installation of containers, you know, with Docker singularity. So it's good first to test your pipeline with the test data. So that's why you add profile test if, and if you run like a Docker containers, so it's like containers in Docker. So you put your yeah, test Docker. And these tests are really useful because it's like it's small data set and it will run the whole pipeline and test, you know, if you can the, uh, run the pipeline on, uh, for example, on your computer. If you have the singularity, did you change Docker for singularity? Actually, yeah, oh. uh, you need uh, yeah to have a look. If the profile says that, it, because here in the profile to uh, have singularity, it has to be true in the configuration file. So you have to go and see if it's set to true in the configuration file. Because here, profile Docker, it will set Docker true and false, for example, for the singularity, you know, or other, yeah. And then yeah, here, the output. So when you run, you know, it's like this with the test data and using Docker. So you see as uh, Nick showed, yeah, how uh, the processes, like uh, you have a mm -hmm. check when it finishes. When something fails, it appears like a false or at least- Yeah, you, how you get an error. You don't get this check. <laughs> And then the next step is uh, running, you know, it's like the um, next flow workflow with your own, you know, data sets. This, uh, if you, well, uh, the NF core launch RNA seq, uh, it will pop up, you know, like an interface. And then it will ask you where it's like, give me the input or, input and you put the input the output you know it's like file and then uh, the release you want from this you know it's like it's helpful to start you know it's like with uh, nf core launch uh, rna seq if you're not really used to like a uh, next flow and then if you want to uh, run it uh, offline you have nf core download sorry, uh, sorry. RNA sorry i lost a bit what is launch what launch is? if uh, if you want to launch the pipeline, mm -hmm. but uh, you're not very familiar, you know, it's like with uh, uh, Nextflow, so you will get an interface mm -hmm. and it will ask you for which release do you want from that pipeline, which input file, which output, you know, folder, mm -hmm. you know, input folder, sorry, and output, you know, like so you will go like, yeah, these processes to uh, like uh, run the Okay. Would that one ask you like, yeah, for example, the aligner, like if you're using 
Oh, then Sam or Haisa to what do you specify it there? Yeah, actually, it will. Uh, what I saw, it's like, yeah, it will go and ask you questions so it, to run, you know, the pipeline. So, for example, okay, where do you have this? Where do you have that? It's mainly configuration. And then uh, troubleshooting uh, pipelines. First, uh, yeah, run, you know, the pipeline with the test data set. Start small, run uh, pipeline test first. If you have, uh, you know, for modules, you know, start with like a, a process, try to run this process and try to see which kind of error and error message uh, you'll get. And read the log, check the work directory. And if, you know, have a bug and still, you know, it's like can figure out which kind of error you're getting, uh, the actually you have to go to Slack. They have a very like the community is very active, and uh, you can yeah post there your error, and uh, they will respond to you. Yeah, it's it's very good actually. I had lots of issues when I started learning Nextflow, and I asked them many questions, and they were very very yeah reactive. And here, yeah, the Slack to the NF core uh join and they have their like all the information about trainings about the hackathon uh the i think uh, these last two days there was a hackathon in boston so yeah you can go to slack or to youtube to get all the information about that oh, i have a question um uh, this next flow can, can support uh, uh multiple languages for example, if I have modules in Python and I have modules in R and I can yeah. like integrate because I have pieces of code here that made something and yeah. I don't want to write again, so I can mix it. Yeah, you can, can have R, bar, all, yeah, yeah, you can have. And but I have to build a profile for each one. No, 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 no. The profile is only, for example, let's say you want to say, I want this to run this pipeline locally. Profile local. Oh. I want to run this in Slurp. As to define, profile, like, yeah, like, Slurp. Oh. I want to run this in the cloud. Profile AWS. Okay. Profile Azure. It's only that, yeah, the profile. You don't need to do anything if you have, yeah. Um, and then the last thing is about, sorry, is about useful links. You have lots of information in the NF Core uh, YouTube channel. Oh, sorry, English here. Uh, in many languages, English, Spanish, French, Hindi, Portuguese, all the languages you want. Yeah, you have, yeah, Arabic is missing, but I'm, I'm sure that, uh, yeah, soon they will have also Arabic. They have a very good uh, GitHub and Slack. Slack is very helpful. Twitter also. And please, uh, yeah, so uh, the last two days there was a hackathon in Boston and they have already, you know, all the information and all, uh, so it was streamed on YouTube. So you can get everything, yeah, on their YouTube like channel. And there is a good uh, Carpentries, if you go here, you can see there's introduction to bioinformatics workflows with Nextflow and NFCore. And it's a very, very good documentation about how to get started with Nextflow. And then uh, I think that's all. So here for further reading about a simple RNA-seq workflow, we provided these links, the Nextflow, main Nextflow documentation, uh, here the link to the GitHub uh, of like, uh, I think to our uh, GitHub and uh, here the link to the extensive community supplied Nextflow uh, work, workflows repo. And uh, as a conclusion, uh, workflows are recipes for task automation. Uh, nextflow.nf file syntax cover channels and task process uh, file syntax workflow file syntax so we'll go from like um, so 
channels uh, connect processes from processes you will get modules and from modules you will get uh, workflows and here so nick yeah had like a code demonstration and which shows uh, next flow usability and dialogue interpretation and the nf core community resources show extended variety of documented uh, workflows and thank you if you have any yeah other question well, in what part of this uh, a workflow, I define that I want to work with two languages in the channels or when I define the process? When you, the... when you define the process, so uh, Shan showed uh, here. Let me go. Uh, it's here in script. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you can use shell, you can use R, you oh. can use Python. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so... In the processes. Yeah. Okay. In the process. When you define the process, there in script, uh, you define knowledge. Let me stop sharing. And please... Yeah, so, I don't know if you have a question. I don't know if this is a good or question. Or something you're interested in for next session, actually. Tell us, because depending on the needs, you know, we will, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Well, so I don't know if this is a good question, because I'm learning a lot. No, yeah, it's okay. But can you go run ahead. Nextflow like in a container? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because our, so in Apua, he set up there's a container that has Nextflow in it, but we don't use Nextflow. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about trying this. Yeah, you can you can run it. I tried to run it, I think, in Docker, and you can run it in container. You run Nextflow itself in Docker, and then like yeah, because it's like getting weird with like the processes are also inside like containers inside a container. Maybe yeah. it works. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah, you have to swarm, I think. You have to try yeah, to connect the containers. But you can do that. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, so if I have like a, I don't know if it's a next flow, if there is any pipeline for that. But let's say I have something that we do, scripts that we do, and I want to be able to incorporate that into next flow. Mm -hmm. I would like to. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I. Yeah, hopefully this was like a good starting point yeah, for yeah. doing some of that. Um, yeah, I guess it's just a matter of usually you make like, if you had individual shell scripts, sometimes those translate nicely into individual processes. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. If you had particular questions, I can always help as well. Okay. Um, but Yeah, I yeah. think uh, they are like uh, shell scripts with R's, R scripts that go to an R script. Yeah, it's like a lot of what we've done with SpeakEasy, so it sounds pretty similar. Yeah. It might help to, to think in terms of like if if you're trying to develop a new pipeline from the ground up versus um, trying to get somebody else's pipeline to run. Um, and yeah, so, so there, because there's a lot of um, pipelines out there that have been developed for specific tasks, um, you might, you might just check if the documentation is sufficient to be able to run it and then also understand it um, in a way that gives you the confidence to um, use it for um, you know uh, development or, or analysis um, but uh, yeah I think that that's one of the benefits of nextflow is um, the NF core community and also the exceptional documentation for sure I can start. What is the best way to start with the answer? Maybe keep a look in the pipelines that exist and then try to implement in something. Yeah, I mean, yeah, a lot of times there's, there, um, yeah, like Hedia said, there's like so many pipelines already exist. Mm -hmm. So it's good to just make sure that like what you're doing is um, actually new enough to make your own pipeline. Um, but yeah. Uh, 
Because it, it is like uh, that if something is done, why is the mother to try to do it? Yeah. yeah. We just built like a whole cut and tag pipeline, but there's a next little cut and tag. Yeah. Yeah, like, that like has everything. Right? Yeah. yeah. First to keep a look and say, okay, I can maybe add something like you say in our day. Yeah. Yeah, you mm -hmm. change like a configuration file. When I start, you know, like developing my RNSC pipeline, I was very excited. Mm -hmm. And they told me, did you have a look at NF Cordo RNSC pipeline mm -hmm. before developing yours? Because I think we have everything there. So it's better that you help us yeah, improve the pipeline rather than duplicating it. And it's it's interesting that because we, we usually, when you want to develop a function or something, you go to Google and try to look something that you can implement in the more file. Mm -hmm. But it's basically a, like a copy paste with some kind of modifications and you implement. But here, it's like a more organizer because the let's to say the developers are in a, in the same core trying to improve when it's done and not just like pulling information and making. It's kind of possible to do. Yeah, here because you yeah. take the pipeline, you download it, and then you can run it, you know, changing the input folder, the output, you know, uh, configuration file. So with small changes, you have your pipeline running rather than starting, you know, writing the whole workflow and what's, yeah, the benefit from there. Oh yeah, also next time, something that you might want to know about, we'll talk about modules. So uh, we sort of referred to it briefly. Basically it's like small sections of the pipeline. So like maybe if someone wrote a pipeline that has some things you do, but not everything, mm -hmm. if you can take their modules and then build from there. Um, oh, you can? Yeah, yeah. so that's... Yeah, it's it's yeah, when yeah. you sell the hackathon, no? That they made a module and you can yeah. take it yeah. and implement it. Yeah, that's what they do. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, like maybe there's a quality control like module, mm -hmm. an alignment module, stuff like that. So it makes it much easier to um, start from something that you might use. And then, um, yeah. So here, the let's to say that the core idea is to take the attention to the inputs and the outputs in order to give the flow uh, some kind of congruent, uh, you know, uh, uh, when you're processing the data. Uh, and I want to integrate new modules in the middle. Let's to say a quality control, like you say. So you have to take care of these kind of formats in the inputs and the outputs. And the, oh, um, like, I guess in theory, uh, yeah, we'll talk about this more next time. But in theory, um, with like the DSL two syntax, like the workflow, you just specify. Like, it shouldn't require modifying your existing stuff. You can just kind of like, add yeah. a line for like. Uh, yeah, uh, just modify uh, when next flow run you know, whatever pipeline, uh, yeah, next flow. And then you dash, dash, and then, you know, it's like you add, for example, uh, your, like, let's say, input file or input, output, and then the configuration, and you provide your own, the configuration file. That's all. You don't have to go, oh, yeah, it's like modified or stuff. So, yeah, if it's, like, in the mm -hmm. middle of the pipeline, it's mm -hmm. also not much harder because you just have to sort of add a line in the um what's called like the workflow uh segment i guess um so they want to it shouldn't require too much uh like specific like you don't basically just have to say like what the input and output are for that mm -hmm. piece of the workflow but everything else stays the same yeah yeah i know it's kind of like vague right now just to say it no no you understand that i need to see uh... Yeah, if only you have to change a few things. Yeah, no need for lots of work. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, Thank you. See you next week.